It's time for the wrestling perspective. Tonight, it's the only podcast on earth with Jason Kindle, the former Major League Baseball All-Star, Darren McCarty, the four-time Stanley Cup champion, Lars Fredrickson, the rancid man. We got P.D. Williams, and we have our very special guest, someone who's about to wrestle for, for the Impact World Championship, February 13th, 2021. That's right, at No Surrender, it's Tommy Dreamer versus Rich Swan, the birthday boy himself, Tommy Dreamer. And before we get going, Lars, I'm going to step aside because this is something you want to jump in with. So. I wanted to, you know, Tommy, tonight I wanted the first question because I know a lot of people, and welcome to the show and thanks for coming, number one. Um, but I know a lot of people are comparing this the AEW impact sort of uh, thing with the ECW invasion. And But my first question for you is, it's just, you know, obviously it's it's kind of a different thing. I would think, my assumption is, can you tell us like what the differences are between the ECW and to, to and that whole trip to what's happening now? Uh, the Zoom thing faved out. I missed the first part. I'm sorry. Basically, what I said was people are comparing the AEW impact thing that's happening with the sort of oh, like, okay. you know, with the ECW uh, yeah. invasion. So what I wanted to know, the big differences here, because it seems like the first one was a little bit more hostile with while well, this is more like a co-op. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I really don't have a lot of information where as talents, a lot of times we're also kept in the dark. Um, I know, and, and Petey can tell you too, days of TV um, are pretty hectic. I had no clue that Tony Khan was actually showing up. And then all of a sudden, like I saw at first I saw Jerry Lynn and I was like, I know Jerry Lynn lives in Nashville. And I'm like, Hey, what's going on, man? You know, say hello to everybody. And then I was like, oh, cool. Nice to see you. And then uh, here came Tony Khan, Matt Hardy, private party. Now, I knew private party was coming. I didn't know Matt Hardy was coming. I didn't know they'd actually be there. And we had discussed like, hey, is some talents going to be there? But I had no clue. And even like, and PD wasn't there. But there's, they purposely will put holes in the show where it'll say, Tommy Dreamer and Lars will be facing blank or I've even seen them go f as far as like Tommy Dreamer and, and Lars will be facing Petey Williams and Jason Kendall and Jason Kendall and Petey Williams are like a dummy team in case it's weird. It, it has a lot to do with the internet and trying to just to like make sure things don't get out. The beauty of wrestling now in COVID, a lot of spoilers don't get out, which is cool, because then you know they come from in eternal, but we haven't had that in a long, long time. Uh, even when I was watching uh, Hard to Kill, when Rich Swan got pinned, I was like, what? I had no clue. I wasn't the agent for that, but that came out of total, and that wasn't how, sometimes on like format sheets, it'll say, who's the winner, who's the loser for that. It just, it didn't say anything. It said finish. So to compare it from ECW, dude, as you know, we were, everything we did in ECW was nuts. We had no clue. We were told as talents, we're doing this to help promote our pay-per-view. And what WWE is getting is this, anything can happen on Monday night. That was it. Years, years later, we find out there was, you know, Paul was getting paid from WWE, all this stuff. But when we went there, the first one was uh, me and Sandman showed up at one of their pay-per-views. When I tell you, like, we had snipers in the building, meaning like the Eliminators, Bubba, we had wrestlers planted in the Philadelphia spectrum that if me and Sandman, if that locker room empties out, we're going to fight for real and we're going to fight live on pay-per-view. Um, and it was like me and Raven who were going, they have to know, they have to know. And I remember Bradshaw, I didn't know him. He was Justin Hawk. He literally looked at us and he's like, what the fuck you guys doing here? And gave us like, and I was just like, I'm playing up. And I noticed in his eyes, I was like, he doesn't know what's going on. And he's in the match. And 
he was managed by Dutch Mantel. Now, Dutch smart. Dutch is like, just go with it. Just go with it. And the only person who knew was Savio Vega. And Savio had said, and I talked to him about it too, Vince told him right before his match, hey, do something by the steps and then something's going to happen. And just go with it. Don't fight. When their security, when I'll never forget Jerry Briscoe, man. Jerry Briscoe, he was like, you motherfuckers, I'll fucking stretch you. Like, And you saw hatred in his eyes. <laughs> and I'm like, and they're grabbing me. And I'm literally pulling my hands back. And I'm like, dude, this is about to go down. Right. And from wrestlers in the back, they, they all thought it was 100% like, oh, we're these crazy ECW guys. We're invading their show. And there was a locker room full of wrestlers that were willing to come out and fight us, but we would have had our guys meet them and it would have been a real brawl. I mean, literally be, uh, you know, you're at a baseball game uh, and another team shows up and, Hey, we're going to just cause a disturbance. You know, you're going to, there's going to be controversy during that. that That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, and, it's unique for you because not only were you part of that, but you're part of what's happening right now. And that's the point I was, I was really trying to get after. It's like, you know, over your career, this hasn't happened, you know, yeah. very much. And here you are, uh, you know, involved, you know, in both, in both things, which I think is pretty remarkable. And as, as, as a wrestler, I mean, that, that's, that's, you know, to stand the test of time is pretty cool. It is cool. And, you know, it's funny too, like this whole thing we're doing with Rich Swan. a lot of people are like, oh my God, Dreamer, you're so old. You know, you're going to meet hate on social media and, or they're saying I'm not a number one contender because hmm. I don't win that much. And I was just like, you know, in 1997, a 26 year old kid who won, who was the real number one contender, gave up his title shot to his mentor who was 55 so that guy can wrestle on ecw's first ever pay-per-view and oh by the way that person who gave up his title shot also didn't wrestle on the first ever ecw pay-per-view and i was like oh yeah by the way that person was me <laughs> and to try to explain wrestling to was uh i told you know the champion rich swan has beaten everybody that the company put in front of him and he says on his promo I want to do something that I want to do for once. And, you know, there have been times in every sport where you've seen, I mean, I just saw Gordie Howe uh, play with his two sons. They signed him to a game, greatest player of all time, uh, one of the greatest. And he was able to do that just to play. Or, or wasn't, uh, was it Scotty Bowman came yeah. back to coach one game? Uh, no, it was, uh, you're right though about, Gordy played with his two sons in yeah. Hartford and stuff, but he did come back and he played an IHL game in yep, Detroit that's it. for the Vipers. Yeah. So he played in like in like five decades or something yep. like that. So it was like, but it, that's you know, I, I'm gonna say, but that's the special like I'm the storyline guy, right? So the fact that what I love right now about about AEW and impact and with the ties into uh, what we learned with, you know, the bullet club, it all makes sense. There's all the path yes. to it. And the fact that the, you explain that to me now that it all comes full circle. That's the beauty of wrestling. I wanted to ask you, Tommy, cause I've been a huge fan. I mean, you know, obviously back the ECW days, I can go on and on how crazy you are and, and putting your body on the line. <laughs> But my my favorite match of last year of yours was your softcore match in the talk of shop of mania. I thought I came, we were watching that. Me, me, Petey, Dennis were watching that together, and I literally snorted because I thought just I, I the, the brilliance of that. I guess from being in that match and being around that, because I said to that, I tell friggin' Doc Gals all the time, I see karate man on impact and up, I said, talking chops to feeding ground. Guys are going to be wanting to be that. But to me, that's love of wrestling, and that just showed it. But can you just say, because because you guys seemed like you loved it, but talk about if you're enjoying it so much and why? Uh, it was Terry Funk who told me a long time ago, if you don't change with the business, the business will pass you by. And here's a guy literally at 55, did his first moonsault 
to the floor, not to the ring, but to the floor. And, you know, when he was getting older, he went towards more of the violent stage, you know, wrestling in FMW, doing exploding, he exploding ring matches. He rejuvenated his career with, and as I know, you guys all know this too, you will meet a lot of bitter veterans or bitter people who are in the industry that you all love. And I never want to be that. And you could find comedy in anything. And for that little thing of, you know, yeah, man, we are old. And like saying uh, that was kind of off the cuff too. Cause I was just like, Hey guys, you know, we've been killing each other for years, you know, you know, we're old. And then the whole we're soft core and even like just incredible slowly <laughs> oh, getting to the, to the yeah. ground to try to get to the ground and he's going, hold up. A lot of us, that's real. I was just laying on the floor with my uh, dog and it took me a good <laughs> minute and a half to get up. So I believe it. And you know what yeah, I think? Bro. First and foremost, Tommy, what I want to say is um, happy birthday, early birthday. Um, and I, I think Petey's going to know what I'm getting ready to say too. And actually all of you guys will is you have beaten the crap out of your body for so long. And you just said it right there. You were hanging out with your dog and you can barely get up. Um, the concussions, the um, everything that comes along with it. And it's, it's amazing to me because, I mean, it's not like you're, you weigh 120 pounds. I mean, you're a big man and, and you've been, just been beating the crap out of your body for so long. Um, and eventually those, um, what is it that you're, you're, uh, your sleeve that you've been wearing for however long <laughs> you showed me <laughs> when I was on your show. My knee pads. I've never your washed knee pads. It, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's the same knee pad he said he had to wash it or anything. Yep. And and um it's like the straight old school volleyball knee pads that they wore like in 1970. Anyhow, getting that getting back to how much more of Tommy Dreamer do we got left? Because you're still doing it for a reason. You're still doing it because you probably love it. Oh, absolutely. It, and and your body's gotta just be beaten. I know PD's uh uh body's got to feel the same way but i think people really need to know is you guys beat the crap out of yourselves and you've been doing it for a long time and um you know at some point it is soft jay I, I, soft. I hope we i hope he we soft. have another on, uh, another Bobby won't say 20 it. years Bobby of you Bobby. Won't say it. i'm the truth here Petey's soft now he's behind the camera he and no. i'll tell you to what tommy was saying earlier you know how i know that's true is because yesterday as i'm watching impact and i go to Petey, i text i go hey who's Who's uh, hiding behind the door and this and that and whatever? Because I know he taped it. And he goes, bro, I don't know what order, what door, what are you talking about? I didn't even respond to him because it because the way it's taped and stuff. So that's how I know he's management. So well, hey, you know, and what, what, D, D Mac, you know what? I have a job for you now. Um, I don't know if you know what Impractical Jokers is, but my boy Tommy never got paid from from being putting a dropping a cameo on Impractical Jokers. It's some. Be, I want oh, the enforcer to oh, get up and to get go. Tommy paid. Uh, listen, why don't we? Hey, we can set it up. I got it perfectly. We could just set it up as some sort of gimmick with the wrestling, and they realize that oh crap, he's not a wrestler. But they don't realize I punch for real because I can't wrestle because <laughs> I don't know how to play. I don't know how to play fight. Like like I like I don't know how not to kill. Well, I, mean, I got one year, bro. That's why we. That's why I'm a huge fan. Anyways, enough about me. To get Tommy, let me jump in here and get this back on track. And here's a question. <laughs> that's why you're here. <laughs> and by the way, for all the impractical jokers fans, I agreed not to get paid. That's all good. I know it doesn't matter if you did or not. You still need to get paid yeah. and stiff me. I literally should have asked for like ten dollars every time they play that episode because I think they play it every day. They do. Well, but, but they do. All right. Much. Well, back back to getting this thing on track. Tom, Tommy, you're about to turn 50. You're about to wrestle for the Impact World Championship. What's the difference? Because people online seem a little bit excited about this. But if you go to a different brand and they bring in a guy that's four years older in Goldberg, the fans are reacting totally different with hatred and what's he doing? He's old. What's the difference between you and Goldberg and the way the fans view you two? That is a great point. Uh, I think for me, it's because I've never stopped and I've been in the trenches my entire time. Um, Bill Goldberg, when he was in WCW, he had a very, very nice gig. You know, Bill Goldberg definitely was the, that and the NWO were the two striving forces in WCW. Then when he went to WC, uh, WWE, 
he was there kind of like as a part-time player. And then when he didn't want to be there, I mean, the wrestling fans shit all over him. I'll never forget that match. Um, it was him and Brock Lesnar at Madison Square Garden and with Steve Austin as the referee. And, you know, the, the wrestling fans are basically booing the crap out of both of them and like telling them, uh, you know, a lot of insane chants back when we used to have fans. Uh, I just think for me, like I said, I'm still grinding it out. I had a crazy six man with uh, Eric Young, Cody Diener, and Joe Doring. Um, I've never stopped wrestling. And I mean, even before the pandemic, I mean, hustling 200 plus shows a year from, you know, UWF halls to shitty venues to beautiful venues with AEW running my own shows with House of Hardcore. I, I think that's where fans appreciate it more because I never, I never stopped grinding. And, you know, yeah, like you said, I do love it. Uh, when my body, I weirdly feel great. I've had a lot of, I mean, I've had every injury in the world. I told you I've yet to have a surgery. And I think once I do, my whole body is just going <laughs> to fall apart and then I'll have to say goodbye. Um, Cause I have weird injuries. Like uh, I, right before WrestleMania two years ago, I went to pick up a guy. He was super heavy and I tore, uh, I basically need Tommy John surgery. And now I have a weird lump whenever I work out. It looks like I have a, a third elbow hang on the base. And I go to, a, a, I'm very, I never drank, never did drugs, but I, I go to a, a lot of things to keep me, to holding me together. And my friend has a lot of like, you know, x-rays and lasers and all this stuff, uh, cryotherapy. And, you know, he's just like, you probably, that's either going to snap or you just eventually have to go and get it fixed. I just don't want to go, especially in COVID, I don't want to go get anything fixed. So I'll just, you know, we no. have, we all have our bad days and, and I use this as a great example. My mom is, she's going to be 80 and oh no, she is 80 and she has knee replacement. She has all these aches and pains. She never traveled the world. She never got to live her dream. I know we're all going to have these aches and pains, but uh, I'm okay with it because I I've traveled the world many times. I've been doing something that I've loved since I was nine years old. And I'm blessed to be doing it still for this long. And, and I know, and, and I mean, you know what's go ahead. No, you know, what's cool about that is, is, is times do change and you have to change with them. And I wish some of the younger wrestlers, some of the younger hockey players, baseball players, some of the guy, I mean, bands, some of is everything's catered to now. You just get whatever here, here you have. And they, they think like, if you have a, a strained hamstring or like a slight pull, you're out for a week. And the fact that you have put in the time you put in and people still love you. Like, I'll be honest with you. And I'm, I'm a wrestling fan. When Goldberg came out, I'm like, what? And we all had this little text thing that, uh, that we sent back and forth. And we all kind of said the same thing, but you're different and you're right. It is the grind that you did. It's, it's, it's the fact that you haven't stopped. You love doing it. But if you think, and I can honestly tell, say, somebody asked me, when was the first time, or no, how healthy were you at the end of your career, whatever? And I said, I can honestly say that the, the game, the first game that I ever played was probably the only game that I didn't feel pain because I was, <laughs> it was my first big league game and I was on cloud nine. Everything after that, you're going to have your bumps and bruises now. You haven't, you said you have a third elbow coming out or wrist or whatever. That's, people don't understand. I mean, and you're still going out there because you love it. And to the younger generation that, that are coming up and the, the Tommy dreamer that they want to be like Tommy Dreamer. Well, you better look at Tommy dreamers whole career and look what he's gone through and look what he, the, he's played through or wrestled through because that's something that is, is definitely lacking um, today. Yeah. But I mean, listen, it, it's also the grind. Uh, you know, Lars playing uh, in a famous band, it's going from, shithole place <laughs> having to lug your own stuff somewhere you guys did it when you're playing you know baseball when you're playing hockey bus rides car rides all that stuff that's all the paying the dues i mean there, there's times i'll never forget man we flew home from japan smoking section and ah. bull, it was bubba ray who he messed up his ankle 
and he's icing his ankle. He's 400 and something pounds. <laughs> Where in the last row, it's Bubba Ray, myself in the middle, and Perry Saturn, who's about 240. Wow. The three of us, miserable as miserable could be for 14 hours. My back hurt. I remember uh, when you take off and you have uh, back in the day when we used to, you know, basically bleed a lot. We would just put white tape over our head. And every time you take off, your head would start bleeding because of the pressure when you get when. So I'm trying to like move and like, hey, man, can you get me one of those the the little napkins so I could put it on my head because my head's bleeding. And Perry's like, now you're that gross guy. On the plane. Yeah. <laughs> what? And Perry's like, brother, shut the fuck up. I can't even move. And Bubba's <laughs> ankle, because now when you're in a pressurized cabin, uh -huh. your ankle's swelling up as well. We did that for 14 hours, you know, but thinking about it now, it's that paying your dues process and it help you, you know, uh, everything you I have in my life is because of professional wrestling. And, you know, you're, you're blessed from your kids to your family, to your house, your houses, all that stuff. I mean, uh, again, the fact that we're all still doing it or, or contributing, I know Jason, you, you know, you could pretty much be a, a coach or a manager when you, hey, you know what, I'm just going to hang out with my family. Cause I missed a lot of that. That's, that's a lot of people don't have that option. Very true. Very true. Pete, before you ask your next question, because I know you're sitting on something, I, I got one more question, and this is something that I've, I've really been excited to ask you is, uh, I don't know if you're still doing the Edge and Christian show, which I'm, I, I'm a big fan of that, but you're one of those few people that Edge and Christian, WWE, you're popping up on AEW and Impact Wrestling. How does Tommy Dreamer get away with working for three of the most major, major companies and up until what a few months ago, they were all separate and didn't share talent. It's Tommy dreamer, uh, man. <laughs> I don't know. I've, uh, I had a, I think Jimmy Hart was probably the only other person to do stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I just always, uh, but it I says mean, a lot about you, right? In, in a industry where talent doesn't get shared a lot here, you are in WWE impact and AEW just kind of doing the Tommy dreamer thing. Well, every company needs somebody to beat, damn it. And if no one else is, I'll step up. And well, do you it. know what? A lot of it's the respect, too, I bet. Yeah. Listen, uh, honestly, uh, from, from Vince McMahon, Scott Demore, Tony Khan, they've all, you know, treated me great. I, I'm, I'm friends with all of them. And they also know, like, I, I'm very, very straightforward. If I like something, I will tell you. If I don't like something, I will tell you. And I just always treat people like how I want to be treated. You know, that's it. And, did know, it go? Did did it go? Did anybody else? Did it just go over their head like that when he said, "Tommy Dreamer, who's your number three of of my all time hardcore guys between it's you, Mick Foley, and Terry Funk." See, right? that's, that's has the never had a You're my number one. He's never had a surgery. Yeah. Dude, did that and are you? Does that, I mean, is it just me? Blows my mind. No, it blows my mind. Have you athletes? Every podcast. So it's, the, it's that damn volleyball knee pad, D Mac. Oh, that blows uh, what, me away, bro. That's you just yeah, moved up um, to number one from number two. I broke uh, my neck and I wrestled for four months in ECW with a broken neck. And then I broke my back and didn't know it because the whole time wrestling in ECW and uh, I just kept going and after the show I'd be like oh my neck hurts and then I broke my back uh wrestling I blew out three discs I was down for a while maybe two to three months and I was looking at getting that neck surgery but this is a long time ago where they we call it the zipper comes straight up your neck it was before they went in through the front and they were like hey you're going to be out for a year and there's no guarantee it will work if you ever wrestle again. And I was 27 years old and I was like, nope. And uh, I said this, I think the last time uh, my trainer was WWE Hall of Famer, Johnny Rods. And uh, he always said <laughs> that if, and I don't recommend anyone do this, if you have <laughs> a, a experience like a, a trauma, go back right away and take another big bump. So I was wrestling Lance Storm and I was like, dude, just body slam me on the concrete. And he body slammed me on the concrete. And I was like, all right. And I've been good. So <laughs> that's how I uh, get done 
I came back from that. I don't recommend anyone doing that. That's no, but it shows <laughs> shows you what you're willing to do for what you honestly like to what you're willing to do for something that you love. I also too got to do something that I wanted to do since I was eight years old. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I get it, and that that's the mentality, and I love it, man. I love and it. I, I'm I'm sure you miss it. Uh, you miss the camaraderie. You miss a lot of that stuff. Uh, I can't speak that's why for you. But there's parts. That's why yep. we do this, right? That's why, yeah. you know, yeah, that's what we're all talking about. Is, and, and to be able to connect with guys who are still doing it so they can, you know what I'm saying? So Absolutely. now like I'm, buddy, I'm buddies with, with Rhino. So Terry, so, so just to be, see that you guys are at the, and love doing it and appreciate it. And to hear you talk to us, it, it makes me a bigger fan if that makes sense. All right, Petey, get to the real questions. Hang on one yeah. second. Uh, we had a wrestler recently get hurt, Josh Alexander. He messed up his heel. And as you all know, a heel bruise. He had a, he's a severe heel bruise. And I told him right away, hey, go to Walgreens and get a cushion. Uh, it'll be all that. And he was just, and he was just, it's a little gel thing. It's like a ramp. You put it in your, your boot uh, because it'll help you because it's going to hurt. And he was just like, okay, cool, thanks. And then the next morning we're like, Josh doesn't think he could go. And we're like, damn it. Now we got to sit there, rewrite television. And then finally, he's a tough guy. And he was just like, man, I I'm going to do it. It's just a tag match. I I'll get through it. And then uh, it was Don Callis goes, okay, Dreamer, now you could tell him. And I go, I crushed every bone in my heel and wrestled Rob Van Dam on pay-per-view in a walking boot the very next week. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's why I've had there because wh whatever ailment somebody has, I probably got it and I tell them how to get through it. <laughs> That's, I love it. That's being the veteran. Yeah. That's being the old guy. Those are the things. Yeah. Like Lars was saying, yeah. I've I've been a part of a lot of cool things in wrestling, but yeah, I'm attached to two things that were revolutionary. It's just because basically you're old and you're still around. <laughs> I love it. So that's that well, story right there is 100% true. I was there when uh, when you said it. Of course you were. You worked backstage, bro. Your management no, now. We know that. The only thing you missed out was that day. Yeah, it was just like a tag match or whatever. He still went out there. He killed it. He performed. What he what he left out was the day after the next day he got injured. He had like this 20-minute long gauntlet match. And he also had like another like either singles or tag match. And he killed it. Yep. You know? So, and I mean... <laughs> So, Tommy, I got, I got two questions. I only had one just because I'm more curious. We didn't get to talk about it, uh, um, you know, when we saw each other uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, number one, so I know with surgeries, I was recommended to have five different surgeries. I said no to all of them. Um, how many did the doctor recommend every time, like, you know, whatever, like, hey, you should get a surgery? So that's my first question. And my second question while I answer that is uh, just because I wasn't a part of it and I'm a huge fan of talking shop and mania. What, what was it like? Like, what, what was the production aspect of it like? Like, how many days did it take to film and all that kind of stuff? Like, were you guys just all goofing off or, or what? Uh, I'll do talk a shop first. It was literally a one day shoot. Everyone was at Doc Gallo's house. The best was he wasn't there. <laughs> and <laughs> I saw him on the, the, where was he? He was doing something else that I can't say because. Oh, he was contractually obligated to do something else. And Scott basically was in charge with, um, else. who else was in charge? Uh, Carl and uh, Rocky. 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 Rocky and Rocky yeah. Romero. And yeah. a lot like the stuff that I did, I came in and like it was blueprinted and you know rocky's just like hey this is what we want to do and like you know you think of your verbiage and we did it i wasn't there for like the the in-ring matches but the, it was literally shot i think the whole thing in two days that's great and a lot of editing but they also did a california shoot that i know nothing about but i was supposed to be i was in and out in one day yeah that's phenomenal we were all big fans of that and so you should be. It's again, it was awesome. Uh, surgeries. Okay. Uh, when I was told about my neck, you got to get my neck uh, fixed. And I was just like, mm, I don't want to do that. Um, for my back, it's weird now, probably about 
eight years ago, my back was really, really bothering me again. And all your problems will stem from your neck. And I went to get an MRI and the guy was a wrestling fan. He recognized me and it was one of these, he's re he's looking at my x-ray and he goes, he looks back at my x-ray and then <clears throat> he goes, come here. And I was like, what's up? He goes, how are you walking? And I was just like, uh, well, I'm in pain, but it's more when I sit. He said, your, every one of your vertebrae, every one has a bone spur that has connected to each vertebrae. <laughs> and he basically said, your body has given itself its own fusion. Ah. And he's like, that's probably the cause of your problems. But he's like, I have no clue how you're walking. And he, like, he also said, your neck is completely straight. There's supposed to be a curve, but uh, I lost that curve. Um, for my both shoulder, one day wrestling Cleveland uh, at the Agora Theater, I tore my bicep shoulder and pec in one move. And I was supposed to get, they, they told me to get surgery. Uh, I needed surgery. The, <clears throat> I drove that night at four o'clock in the morning from, I checked myself out and drove from Cleveland to Mississauga to do our only ECW show, one-handed. Um, they told me to get that. I, I never also knew about, you know, getting septus or staph from when you have a, an injury like that. When I tore my other bicep, it was, you should, you know, you should, you're, I'm sorry, when I tore my other pec, they said, you know, well, it could heal on its own. And it did. I have a, a weird, and I, I know I've showed you this, I have weird holes in, in both sides of my pecs. I have total man boobs, which also happen with old age. But my bicep, as it looks like a cord that connects from my bicep to my chest. And it, you can literally, like when I curl, it looks like a hole that's connected by a piece of string. Now, I don't even work out in a tank top because I gross myself out. <laughs> and uh, my heel... When I crushed that, he was just like, your bones will grow back. I mean, you're, you're, it'll heal itself. You just got to wear a walking boot. And I, I basically did that. I think, uh, and this, I definitely should have had surgery for my, uh, the Tommy John thing, because now I'm starting to see atrophy in both my arms. And I think the main thing with surgery too is not so much that you could play that you could kind of live more so of a, a normal quality of life, but I just... Like I can't, I mean, Petey, I was a big gym guy. I literally cannot bench the bar. If I bench the bar, it feels like both my pecs are breaking uh, or tearing off my body, but I can do dumbbell presses. So I just counteract. I can't do anything sit-ups. I could do leg lifts. I can't do crunches because then my back gets messed up. I mean, the only thing I could do is leg lifts. That's it. You think you'll do something when you're done? Uh, no. Uh, well, if like you, I, said, if you, I know a good doctor, the best one out there right now, Neil Elitrosh. If someone wants to like do a complete overhaul on me, I will get hair. I'll get fake boobs, <laughs> I'll get abs, whatever, suck some fat out of my ass, whatever you need. If they want to experiment, maybe when I'm all said and done. But well, I think it's pretty cool to go my whole career without a surgery. I think it's unbelievable. And, and I, I say Neil Elitrosh, he is the best out there for baseball wise right now, but I never came back after he did mine twice. So <laughs> I knew I knew you, Tommy Dreamer was an alien. He just told me he just, <laughs> his body repairs itself. Every I knew. Oh, how about the boys coming over to you. meet his daughter? Oh, all our all our bodies heal itself. It's just it, then you have problems where you're they're compensating for other parts, you know, Absolutely. which is all good. Absolutely. I don't know hey, how man, old the ECW and it's That's not crazy. You know, that old school mentality. If you did not wrestle, you did not get paid. I remember, uh, and he walks with a limp. Bully Ray broke his leg, his ankle, and we sawed off his cast so he could wrestle on the first pay-per-view on the first match. And he's like, I have to do this. And the guy who was the ECW doctor, and I say quotes because he was, he was a uh, – practicing to be a podiatrist and he was, didn't even have a doctorate for that but he was our doctor <laughs> and he was like i don't recommend you do this this is my specialty and bub was like i don't give a fuck i gotta do this i, I gotta be that first match and we just sawed it off in the back he walks with his foot to the left a little bit now 
Um, but he had a really good career as well. And, That's the uh, stuff it you bothers him sometimes. Anymore. Yeah, man. Mark? Um, you know, one of the things, I mean, I, I, I really feel why people always get behind you because there was that Goldberg question is because I feel like you were always kind of presented as an underdog and you always, you know, came out there and you showed a lot of grit. You know what I mean? And at this po- moment in wrestling, I feel as a fan, we're at like another golden age, you know? Yeah. Um, it seems like every 20 years now, I think it's almost even bigger and more exciting and so much more to talk about um, just because with everything's happening. Um, and it, we're not talking about the, uh, you know, for me, I'm not really talking about the, the WWE as much. I'm talking about impact and AEW and what's happening there. So for you, I mean, you know, you obviously have wrestled and it sounds like you're like a, a, a you know, someone, a lot of these guys can, every time I hear your name, it's always in context of like, he helps so many people out. Like, it, it's like, you're there for the younger guys, you know, to help bring them up. And um, I want to know as a, as a veteran, um, you know, cause I know not everybody does this, but why is it important to you to bestow your knowledge to the younger guy? Um, because I was blessed with that. I literally would walk through a curtain and I would have Terry Funk, Mick Foley, Paul Heyman, all helping me when I was in my early twenties and Tony Atlas, another guy before ECW, Kevin Sullivan before ECW and then in ECW, I had all these veterans guys helping me out and teaching me mistakes that they made i literally remember and i I think i said it too man i picked up tony atlas at a ymca when i was like 22 years old and i was like why is tony atlas living in a ymca and he literally said kid don't ever drink and do drugs i made millions of dollars and i live uh here i was homeless living in maine under a park bench uh i almost froze to death in the winter and this is a guy who i paid money to see and that stuck with me And like Terry Funk, just like, hey, you know, you're a good looking kid. Philadelphia is a tough town. Uh, Grow a goatee. It'll make you look tougher. And then when when you're my age, it'll hide your double chin. Well, he's right (laughs) because it did both. And uh, (laughs) Mick Foley telling me like all all these little things or the best, Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman would see things that no people would ever see, but also for the fact that and Petey knows this. I, I hated when I would come back from WWE from a match and they were just happy. I hit my time. No one said, Hey, you could have done this better. Hey, if everything was perfect, then I should be world champion. Cause I never was getting, you don't get feedback. We all mess up, dude. Tom Brady just threw friggin' what three interceptions though. He still won the game and he's friggin' Tom Brady, but he still has all these coaches telling him how to be better, telling him how to be Tom Brady. And without that, he's not Tom Brady. Wow, Dmac. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering what what is one of the with all the years or whatever you could tell any listeners out there that he got. What is one of the misconceptions, you know, uh, of wrestling that you laugh about, or is is there one there? You know, they, they, and it's changed, right? Because the nineties. The way you talk about it, and I love it because it shows the evol- the way that all sports have evolved. The 90s, you know, hockey that I played isn't the hockey that's right. being played now, right? And you talked about evolving and stuff, but is there something that is like, or, or maybe it's that's tried and true throughout? Because you fit, what I'm saying is because you're the consistency of, of treating people about how to want to be treated. Because as like Lars asked you and stuff, I just wondered like, what is Tommy Dreamer's message, you know, out there about the wrestling that he loves? Um, I, I would, to answer your first question, uh, the misconceptions still to this day, wrestling fans think they know, and especially with social media, they think that they know what's going on. Um for everyone who said like, why is impact doing this? Um, why are they doing this match? You know, it could have went to so many other people. And when I straight up, like I said before, I said, well, rich beat everybody. And I also said, by the way, did I say yes? And when I say that people shut up, this is all through social media. And they're like, I go, I never said yes. 
You know why? Because you have to tune in next week. And that's <laughs> writing compelling television. And, you know, there's so many different ways to, to go about it. Or just or like I said, not. too, it's what, what I did for Terry Funk is kind of come full circle. But, and like, I mean, I had this whole thing where Terry had guilt and I, you know, I was pissed when Paul told me I wasn't going to be on the first ever uh, pay-per-view. That's right. It is storylines. It, it's the first, I always say it, it's the first sentence uh, of a book. We'll all walk by, maybe I'm going to buy this book. Oh, it's got a cool looking cover. And then do I, I'll read the intro, man. I may still want to read this. And then I got to keep flipping the pages. With wrestling, that's a never-ending book. I watched, you know, up until this week, the Royal Rumble was supposed to be Roman Reigns versus Adam Pierce, And then the week before the pay-per-view, it's, no, it's going to be Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns. And people were getting behind Adam Pierce. He was on his social media saying, I, I, I can't believe this opportunity, all this stuff. Um, it's, it's different. It was my job and, and Paul's job, especially in ECW, to always have the fans guessing. Now with the internet, it's the same thing. Everyone wants to be armchair booker. And, and I know everybody has experienced it. Hell, I'm guilty of it where with the Packers, where the, the coach didn't go for it on fourth down. And he kicked the field goal. That's not – we're all say that's a bad call. That's a bad call. He may lose his job for it. He may not. But that's – human nature but i think with for wrestling everybody thinks they know what's going on and like i'm um, even when i were talking about busted open we were doing the aew thing i had no clue don was showing up in aew and it's but it's always been like that like it, it i never forget to ecw november to remember we had um our first ever parade it was the holiday halloween parade in new orleans bourbon street ECW had a float. It was the craziest night ever. As you can imagine, I will just say ECW, New Orleans, uh, and a parade. I mean, it was nuts. And I was in a main event of that pay-per-view. And at that, at after midnight, I still had no clue who was going to be my tag team partner. And at 6 a.m., Paul Heyman calls my room again, no cell phones, and says, we got Jake. And he goes, you need to go and find a 12 foot boa. And I was just like, Paul, it's six o'clock in the morning. Where the fuck am I going to find a 12 foot boa? And he goes, Tommy, we're in New Orleans. They have them everywhere. And I said, all right, bye. And, but I found out at six o'clock in the morning, who was going to be my tag partner. That Did you night. get the boa? It sounds like a clubby. You're in a wrestler or a clubby. You, Take oh. the snake. He wanted me to find a friggin' 12 foot <laughs> snake at six in the morning when I was friggin' hung over. You one of the few nights I ever drank and I body slammed Mikey Whipwreck on the car and I broke the windshield of the truck and the guy went nuts because he had to drive <laughs> during the parade. These are reasons why I don't drink. <laughs> you brought up Busted Open, which Lars and I, I at least three times a week will call each other and be like, did you hear this on Busted Open? Oh my God, because me and Lars, we are both Busted Open slappies. So I have to give a second, but it, it ties... <laughs> Okay, so can I call time on this real quick? Busted open slappy does not sound like something that would come out of Lars's mouth. This dude has the hardest, heaviest metal music ever. So you, you might want to say something different. I mean, like busted out, we're happy, slappy, we're geeking out. This dude made me crazy. Lars made me crazy because of his music. Jason, a busted open slappy obviously comes out of my pants. Dennis, please. <laughs> exactly. But it, wow. It's uh, it, it's a kind of a shift in the way the industry used to be, where wrestlers protected kayfabe, and you know, once that kind of went away, all of a sudden you have all these guys rushing out and telling all these stories that were supposed to be protected, and not that you were one of them, because what you do is slightly different than what you you know, uh, not picking on them like Conrad Thompson does with all of his guys. Is there a way, I guess, to repair kayfabe? Because we talk about it a lot on the show. And guys like MJF, you know, kayfabe can come back, but not our generation. Maybe for our kids or their kids. But does does it have to be a change in the way podcasting and wrestlers or content like that goes? Uh, it does have to be a change. I'll, here's the weirdness. Mick Foley just tweeted out an apology to 
the guy who played Drew McIntyre last week. And he was like, I, I, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I hurt a fan's feelings because people were saying that Mick Foley, I guess was fat shaming this dude when this guy came out as a comedian to portray Drew McIntyre and he had his butt crack showing and all this stuff. And I was sitting there like, I went and read Mick's tweet and he was just like, Oh, I couldn't believe this was the guy who was in the movie elf or something. Not one of the, he was an elf in some movie. He was an actor. And I was like, Mick didn't say anything wrong. He didn't say the guy was fat. He didn't say anything. And I was just like, you really have to apologize for something like that. When you have comedians who have to uh, apologize for their comedy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, I listen, man, I grew up on Andrew Dice Clay, Andrew Dice Clay. If his comedy started today, he would never make it. We're all, we're (laughs) all wrestling fans. Characters like the Iron Sheik, Kamala, George the Animal Steel, none of them would have ever existed today because you would have groups saying they're portraying this horrible stereotype where if you think about stereotypes, you think about um, all these negative things that wrestling portrayed, it was because of fear where you had, you know, and it was from the history of, uh, of when we were at war, it was the Japanese wrestler. And you always had that. You had the Germans. You had all, all these guys don't, could never exist anymore. Even when they had like, you know, uh, Muhammad Hassan and Davari, literally the CW networks, uh, not the CW network, whoever network they're on, where it was like these characters have to go because they were getting threats from, they're saying they're, they're acting uh, against stereotyping Muslim people and they basically killed the characters in one shot so to for kayfabe you just have to do it differently mjf does it great um when he healed dion warwick on his twitter and she responded i popped big and he's also (laughs) he's healed other people but you have to do that 24 7 or you just stay off of uh social media i'll tell you I literally was on a creative call today uh, for Impact Wrestling, and I said, what if he pisses on this person's grave? We we're talking about a, a loved one who's passed away. And it was like, are you kidding me? You can't do that. I said, we're not literally showing them pissing on a grave, but he could be cutting a promo at this person's gravesite, pull out. You could hear the zip, and you could hear P. You could go to dark, but... Yeah. That's the ultimate sign of disrespect if, if you're disrespecting somebody who's gone. And they're like, we can't do that. And I was just like, okay. Uh, but you're also talking to like, I mean, when you say times change, I did the first ever in wrestling uh, pregnancy angle. I think if that happened today, it cool. would be how dare you have a pregnant woman walking around like that. I, and I told you this the last time I was on. We did the first ever um girl on girl kiss and we got thrown off of every network we were on and we never showed the kiss but we were and we were flooded with people saying we were showing lesbianism and we were and it was just like to paul's response we never showed the kiss but we got thrown off of every network we were on and we were thrown off for at least three weeks and if you didn't play by the rules you wouldn't do it it was our highest selling videotape of all time but even having girls come out in like skimpy outfits, you can't do that anymore. It's, it's, it's a different time. It's a, it's a different era. The business has changed uh, it, for the good or for the bad. Who knows? Um, I think some of the things I remember, like me pile driving girls, I used to do that all the time. I would not do that anymore because you would face so much backlash and i'd be like i never hurt one person i told you this i lost a job because of it i lost a job in the real world a high paying job because i was told that uh someone sent them a videotape of something i did like 10 years earlier where i was arguing with a woman i placed her in a sexual position and i injured her and i was like yeah man that's the pile driver and that person was my wife and they're like well uh our boss is old school and we don't want any domestic violence things. I go, you tell them we're still married. <laughs> and, but I also said it wasn't domestic violence. Like she knew it was coming and it was just like, well, they don't, the network doesn't want to risk it. And I was like, 
wow. when you hire when you hire Tommy Dreamer, you're gonna know that that's your past, and you know. But then other people like Buffalo is always asking me to come up and put people through a table. <laughs> okay, no problem. It's just it's weird. That is that is crazy. Guys, we've got time for a couple more questions before we have to get Tommy out of here. So. And wait, let me just uh, say something else. Um, I literally, and I'll give you all homework to do. If you all have Amazon Prime, yeah. you need to go and watch uh, Memphis, and I'll, and I'll text it to you. It's uh, Memphis Wrestling. It's volume two from 1983. You, you got to go look for, I think it's called CWA. And it's the, the go-home TV between Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee. And it's a loser leave town match. And both guys had real issues with each other. It was probably the most compelling television I've ever seen. Nothing was scripted. There wasn't a lot of matches. And they literally sat at a desk. They showed clips. They talked about their history. It was brilliantly done. And while, and I'm also sitting there. They, they had interviews from everybody from that wrestled there. And then they also have Eddie Marlin, who's the promoter slash matchmaker. And he's like, man, all these wrestlers are calling in because there's going to be a top slot open and you know they want to come from other territories they're willing to and they're using all these terms that were always like for kayfabe reasons and they're they're saying you know he's finishing up in a territory or the jerry lawler could leave or bill dundee can leave bill dundee could leave and if he finishes up here you know what's going to happen where you lose your top draw and they're using all these insider terms. And I'm like, this is in 1983. So none of this has ever changed. And back then, that, and especially down in Memphis, that was real. So it's all how you go approach things. I can say things on the air that, you know, aren't really necessary. Or if you really want to go deep and dive in something, uh, when fans are going crazy, oh, WWE Raw sucks. Or how could Vince McMahon do this, Vince McMahon do that? And I, and I literally sometimes be like, well, number one, it's a wrestling TV show. And number two, I know everyone says Vince McMahon's out of touch. Vince McMahon this. Vince McMahon. I go, Vince McMahon literally just made a billion dollars yesterday. <laughs> Someone handed him a billion dollars. Yeah. He's got to be knowing and doing something right. Something that better than all of us are thinking because nobody has handed me a billion dollars yet. Wow. I mean, it – Real quick before everybody jumps in, uh, let's talk about your podcast real quick. I want to get another plug in because I can't wait to see like Lars or DMAC on your podcast. Uh, call me. I'll have anybody. Almost anybody. Not I'm me. in, dude. Yeah, Lars or DMAC would be – I think you guys could tear down the house with like the three of you guys. But uh, talk a little bit. What's been going on with it? Because like I said, I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, just – Kills time during COVID. <laughs> um, I, I think it's because I'm older. I love everybody's story. I really do. Um, and it's also, you know, when I had Jason on, it's literally just two guys talking shit, just like we're doing here. But I love knowing there's so many insider things that I don't know. And, and like I said to him, everybody thinks – they can play baseball because they literally go out in their backyard and play baseball, but they have no clue what it takes to become a professional baseball player, a professional hockey player, a professional museum, a, a museum, a professional musician, <laughs> oh, or a professional. Hey, you got wrestler. enamored by the, you got enamored by, don't worry, every, all that mummy thing, we, every, you got to guess what's in it behind lines. <laughs> Dude, it, it mesmerizes everybody. everybody. It comes up and we still don't know what's in it. Well, it's definitely not a woman that I gave a pile driver to <laughs> yet. But well, I love I love the stories and I love how people got there. And we all have stories. And uh, with my podcast, it's like this week I have Jordan Grace on. And here's a, a girl who I love being around in the sense of she's so coachable, learns from her mistakes, and she's so intense and then you get like literally during the podcast, she pulls out her brand new puppy and I'm showing her my dogs. And, you know, a lot of people have misconceptions about certain people. And it's just literally, you know, I always say this and, and I'm doing it even more. I want to use my platform for good because there was been so much crap in the world. And, and just like something like your podcast, my podcast, it's just something to entertain and take people away. And that's what wrestling to me has always been about, you know, for 
you want to hate something so bad, you want to hate Raw, then don't watch it. Uh, you want to hate Impact, don't watch it. You want to hate the Red Wings, you want to hate, then don't listen to it, don't watch it, don't, there's so many other things. Go friggin' read a book, go sit in the dark, do whatever you want. But for me, I just want to use my platform for good. And uh, it, I'm not ever trying to like groundbreaking stories. I just, I like to know what got people into wrestling and just talking to people. Man. I love it. Anybody else have anything else before we? Yeah, start? you know, I have. I have two things. Number one, I, I think more than anything is thank you uh, for joking. I can't remember who it was who you choked out with my jersey. That was awesome, though. No, Brian and Myers. I, I, he was yes, so Brian, pissed. Right. He was so pissed because he was a New York Mets right? fan. That's. I love it. Beautiful. <laughs> he didn't know. Hey, listen, man. He didn't know I was going to do that. And I go, it's Kendall's jersey from the Royals. He goes, oh, get it off me. <laughs> I love it. Um, the second one is happy uh, early birthday. But the third one, thank you for giving me this moment right here. <laughs> and here he comes. Oh, uh, yeah. A great night. Without a doubt, my favorite moment in wrestling right there. And 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 talking to you on, on your show and previously, well, I don't know. We, we, we you guys could probably not even see it, but. No, I can see it all, man. I got goosebumps. Talk about goosebumps. So that, and I, that's why I didn't, I didn't mean to be disrespectful when I was looking down, but I was trying to find it. And put, But uh, thank you for giving me that moment because. To me, that well, you talked about goosebumps on the last time we did it. Every time I, I check that out, I get goosebumps. It was awesome. And then to hear the backstory behind that yeah. is even because you didn't know you said and the, how the WWE fans were going to um, react. That was the last time I was nervous. And that was yeah, probably that was awesome. before that was the last time I was nervous. Like I wasn't nervous when I left the WWE, when I was quitting my job, I was like, man, it'll work out. But that moment for me, and I almost like started to cry. I had like oh. self-doubt will mess you up. And I just had like, please let them remember me. Please let them remember. And then when the music hit and I was like, thank you, God. And then just went into Tommy Dreamer mode. But yeah, that was a cool. Thank you for that. And Tommy, definitely keep in touch. And I'll let everybody else say goodbye. But it's uh, good seeing you again. Thank you so much for doing the show. And happy early birthday and good luck. Thank you, man. Hey, Tommy, uh, I love everything that you're about. Been a big fan for years. I'd love to be a guest, but you'd have to swap for on mine, grind time with Darren McCarty. I got to know the why, what makes you tick. But big fan, I'll be continuing to look and uh, enjoying those storylines, bro. You got Stay it. Stay healthy. It. You we'll you. swap podcasts. You definitely do it. You got it. Lars? Yeah, you know, I, I kind of want to bring it back to your match on your birthday. You know, it'd be a nice way to end this all. And thanks again. Happy birthday. Happy, you know, I know it's coming up. Um, and you're going to be 50 years old? Yeah. Still doing it? And that's amazing. So how much, like when you get into the ring, and this is what I always wanted to know about you, is because you do, it doesn't look like you you plan too much before you get in there. It seems very, like, authentic and calling it on the spot and it's like for me as a wrestling fan I never want to know the outcome because I'm a wrestling fan I want the suspension of disbelief I want to be able to turn off the light switch and and believe in it and um how much are you uh, do you actually uh, go in there prepare how prepared are you going in there are you just going to call it uh, I don't know um I've never wrestled Rich Swan. like I said I also didn't say I, I'm going to do it um but uh I it, Come on, on wrestling perspective, let us know that you're going to do it. We want you to go out and kick some ass. Don't do it. Make them wait. Make them watch the show. Make them wait. Don't do it. No, no. so this is we're trying to pump the podcast. No, no, dude. no, 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 no. No, listen, this is the suspension of disbelief. Um, listen, Petey has been my agent a few times, and I've been his, and Petey will be like, what are you going to do? And I'll be like, I don't know. And he'll be like, okay. <laughs> and we have a great relationship um and that's where like that comes in where if you have going for a commercial break you'll be like all right we're gonna do something if we're at the commercial break we'll do it here but if not we'll just go for it so it's it with me it's sometimes it's planned sometimes it isn't um i know we'll get to an eventual finish and we'll just 
kind of sometimes you feel it out there. Sometimes, you know, it, it takes two to tango. I don't know what Rich likes to do. Um, so you just, that's kind of how it is. It's weird. Every opponent is different. Just, you know, for you, every town is different when you do a set. Hey, you know, it's just maybe you cut something out. It's everything is different. It sucks without wrestling fans, but we're performing for our fans at home. And I think especially in impact, everyone works a lot harder because we don't have that crowd behind us. And we know we just have fans watching at home and that's the, that's our audience. And that's hard. <laughs> it really is. Pete, do you have anything? Uh, no, the last thing you just said is completely true. I'll be like, Tommy, what are you doing? And he'll be like, eh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> sometimes I get in a lot of trouble for it because they're like, we missed that camera shot. And I'm like, uh, okay, and I'll, I'll take the heat, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's uh, streamer. Yeah. But no, and, and honestly, guys, Tommy has, uh, oh, he's helped me a lot along the way. And, and, he, and he still does. Like just last set of tapings, you said, hey, Make sure you don't do that because this person doesn't like it. You know what I'm talking about. Right. Um, you know, and, and I'm always learning from, from you, Tommy. So, you know, um, thank you so I much. I just got to bust out one Canadian destroyer before I retire. I got to tell you. Uh, he'll, he'll, got rate, to... he'll rate you on it. Trust me. Don't worry. I'll, he'll rate you on it. I had the greatest pile driver in the history of wrestling until that <laughs> son of a bitch did it. He took it away from me. I told them that story too, Tommy. So they all. <laughs> That was the first day we met, too. Yeah. Well, I don't know who wrote a lot of that, um, you know, the, the, the uh, shooting the, with the wedding and stuff. But one of the things that I laughed out loud is when everybody had to, uh, when somebody had to swear on the PWI 500 or whatever it was. Like, that, that <laughs> shit is, like, so funny. And it was so fast. Like, you could have missed it. But uh, that That's, was. You know, and most of that was all ad-libbed. And I always say this. And we've all been in the same type of locker room situation. If it will pop wrestlers or it'll pop people in your locker room, you know, it'll pop the fans. So that's why that's my, always my go-to because okay. we're our hardest critics. Yeah, that, right. Absolutely. No surrender. February 13th. You may or may not see Tommy dreamer in the main event. Tune into impact to find out coming up. How's that? Is that a good plug right there? Well, they if, if anybody listened, he's going to do it. Wow, we don't know. I'm gonna be there. Hey, Tommy Dreamer, man, come on. Dede, will you gonna be there? That's all we know. What's that? Listen, the man has never had a surgery in his days. If he doesn't have a surgery, that's that why day, he's gonna be he there. Be there. He'll, He'll be there. We nope. don't know what's going on. I could also just snap after 50 years, turn heel, and win the title. Then I could go to AEW, win, fight Kenny Omega, beat the shit out of him, and then I'll just throw it in the trash in WWE on Monday Night Raw and pop. All you have to do is put on some rancid, and all that will come true. Trust me. I got you. I got you. Kill all my good goodwill and credibility right in one week. Wow. I'll go from Tuesday to Wednesday to Monday. Goldberg then. (laughs) Rancid does it to you, man. I'm telling you. Listen, everything from No Surrender to Busted Open to his podcast, go out there, search for Tommy Dreamer. You will follow him. You will love everything he posts. We are huge fans of his. He's a great friend of the show, great friend of all of ours now. Hopefully, you guys will go out and search him. No Surrender, February 13th. Tommy Dreamer, thank you so much for hanging out. Always love you guys. Talk to you later.